Hello again and welcome to Forum for a Better Understanding. We're actually going to build completely on where we started last week. As you know, we're discussing Roman Orthodox, sorry, Roman Catholic and Oriental Orthodox dialogue. And we have a bishop that we have shown you some clips of who was here in July, Bishop Narag Alamizian, and three panelists who are locally based here in the Fresno area. We want to begin today reminding you of Mark Sheeran, who is a deacon at Holy Trinity Armenian Apostolic Church, Father Arshan Avazian, who is the pastor at St. Paul Armenian Orthodox Church, also in Fresno, and across from me, Father Gregory Beaumont, pastor of Holy Family Catholic Church in Kingsburg, and also the bishop's director for our diocese of ecumenical and interfaith affairs, all of those relationships between churches and non-Christian communities. I want to begin, if you don't mind, with what the bishop told us about someone else that he has great affection for, is Aram I, his Catholicos. He already praised last week John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Let's see about his own spiritual leader and what he thinks is the greatness of that man. Let's hear Bishop. The ecumenical movement is the movement of the churches. And the churches participate in this ecumenical movement with their clergy and their laity, with their youth and their women, with people with disabilities. In short, the whole people of God. And when you have a hierarch, when you have a head of a church leading you in that journey, you feel that you are participating through your old church. And not only you're fulfilling your responsibility as being an ecumenical officer or a diocesan bishop or a teacher in the Sunday school or a youth director, etc. So His Holiness has been involved in the ecumenical movement with this clear understanding that through the ecumenical movement, he's serving his church more fully and he's serving the Church of Christ more responsibly. You know, I want to thank Mark Sheeran for having introduced me to Bishop Narag and for having gotten him into our studio and then having hosted him at a breakfast at his home. So thank you, Mark, very much. Now, what can you tell us about the importance of Aram I and his leadership, what His Holiness has been to your church? Well, actually, uh, Bishop Narig is following in the footsteps of Catholicos Aram I because when Catholicos Aram I was a bishop, an archbishop of the Diocese of, of Lebanon, he also served as the ecumenical oh. officer of the Holy See of Cilicia. And he's been, from his years at Fordham University, all the way through uh, the, the diocesan bishop uh, and through Catholicos, he has been very active in the ecumenical movement, uh, namely the World Council of Churches. He was a vice moder moderator for several terms, so he's dedicated. So Bishop Nottig's boss is fully and totally behind him and behind the ecumenical movement and believes in it. In fact, he just wrote a book, authored a book called um, Saint, Saint Nerses the Graceful on Church Unity. And he's, it's a book that, that His Holiness penned and talks about the, the ecumenical movement that started back in the 12th century between uh, uh, St. Gregory... I'm sorry, St. Nessus, the, the, the Graceful, and, and, uh, and Constantinople at that time, wow. the, the, di the dialogue. Wow. Uh, the so it goes way yeah. back. We've had, we've had very close relations with other churches because of the, the location, geographical yeah. location of Cilicia, yeah. being in the crossroads of, of uh, even the part of the crusade. So, so we, were, we, were, we, were, uh, we were influenced by the Roman Catholic Church in now, a good way. Now, what's very interesting and leading into the very next question, it's almost so perfect how this happens. I then asked, how important is 
Muslim Christian conversation. And the bishop said, oh, Aram I is so committed to this. And let's hear what the bishop says about this effort. So when we speak about Christian-Muslim dialogue, we are not speaking about it in isolation. But we are speaking, looking into the larger framework of the interfaith relations. Nowadays, when the Middle East is facing many political, social, economic hardships, coming together of Christians and Muslims is a prophetic message that we have to live together despite of all the hurdles, despite of all difficulties that we face. We have to live together and in that living together, we have to show that we are in solidarity with our commitment to have a better world, not only for us in the Middle East, but all over the world where we are the stewards of the creation of God entrusted to us and put in our fragile hands. Well, it's obvious that people who have lived in the Middle East can obviously identify with this whole commitment, uh, this effort, and the need for it. Father Arshin, just remind us of how important this Muslim-Christian relationship is. Jim, in America, we have a situation where people hear about um, adherence of our faiths in theory. You know, be it Muslim, sometimes a Catholic could go through life <coughs> without ever meeting a non-Catholic or yeah. They, they may have a Protestant neighbor or whatever, but not necessarily a Muslim or <clears throat> an Armenian Orthodox or a Greek Orthodox. The Middle East is completely different, the picture is. Uh, the Armenian Church in general, uh, but the Sea of Cilicia in particular, where Bishop Nadek comes from, uh, is a situation where it is impossible to live in any part of the Middle East without having an Armenian neighbor. I mean, a, a, an Orthodox or a Muslim neighbor or someone from another Christian denomination. And <clears throat> there are intermarriages sometimes, not necessarily interfaith, but intermarriage and Orthodox, a Catholic, Maronite, and so on. So they are face-to-face um, -to -face in real life to bear witness to their faith in a, a daily life circumstances. And, and um, I grew up in, in a neighborhood where I had Muslim neighbors, I had Catholic neighbors, I had Orthodox neighbors, and I had uh, French in Lebanon, oh, French yeah. neighbors. Uh, and that's where the reality of interfaith and uh, ecumenical relations have to be manifested without necessarily each one of these neighbors of different faiths and different denominations, Christian denominations, knowing exactly that that's what they're doing. They interact. And I think America will benefit from the uh, experience of the Middle East. Not to say that history has been kind to that setting. No. Uh, there have been conflicts, there still are conflicts, there probably will be more conflicts in the future. But on the uh, neighborhood level, that conflict, that difference is diminished when people, if, if, if one neighbor is out of rice, they'll go to the Muslim neighbor without any problem and get some rice. You know, we're going to be taking a break, but before we do, there's one more question that the bishop is going to answer, and then when we come back, we'll be able to discuss it as a panel. I had to ask him, what are some challenges that we are definitely needing to face if we hope to uh, prevail in the ecumenical effort? What are the big obstacles and difficulties we need to confront? I believe that the big challenge 
the greatest challenge that all of us are facing is how to respond to our Christian identity. Being a Christian in the 21st century, what does it mean? And being a Christian, we all know very well that is not an isolated reality, but it's a communal belonging. We belong to each other. We are not a Christian, but we are Christians together. And in this sense, the ecumenical movement has to deepen its reflection on being the church of Jesus Christ, being community, being Christians together. The other challenges for the ecumenical movement, the shift of Christianity from the west to the east, from the north to the south. We see that the weight and the numerical size of Christians are growing more in South Africa, South America, and in Asia. There was a time when we were sending missionaries from the West, but now we are called to become missionaries all over the world. The enculturation of Christianity is not an option anymore, but it's a call. And in this sense, the ecumenical movement has to read the signs of the times, the signs of the changing movements, and to be responsive to them. The other challenge is the interfaith dialogue and living together. When you go to any part of the world, you see people of all faiths living together. We are neighbors to each other. And this means that we are not dealing only with purely Christian issues, church-related issues, but we are dealing with broader issues concerning all religions and all people. We'll be back in one minute to further discuss what the bishop just shared and to have the second half of our program. So please stay tuned and don't go away. KNXC thanks all its loyal viewers and respected businesses who have supported your Catholic television station. Now you can support KNXT with program underwriting by having your name, your company's name, or organization associated with your favorite program. Detailed information about you or your company will appear before and after each program or day part you select. Keep the quality and spiritual message alive and make a difference. Call 559-488-7440 today or go online at knxt.tv to find out more about program underwriting on KNXT. I've really enjoyed uh, Bishop Nareg's uh, comments, and he had such positive things to say about the leadership of Pope John Paul II and the excitement movement of the Church in the effort toward cooperating with the Holy Spirit that draws us together. But in talking of, of the challenges, um, it reminded me that for all the good and wonderful things that Pope John Paul II did, I've even met some Catholics that they've really... Um, They've really had a hard time with it, and we're almost offended by some of the ecumenical things. And I think the reason is exactly what Bishop Nareg was saying about this issue of Christian identity, that people are afraid that if we reach out to other Christians or other denominations, that somehow that automatically implies a watering down or compromising of what we believe, or that we'll lose something of our own identity, of our own story, and especially for any group that has had a difficult history or a persecuted history, uh, they don't want to 
to let go or to give up of who they are. And so uh, one of the important challenges in the ecumenical movement is really to assure people that our unity and our reconciliation, our moving together with other Christians, in no way um, can be authentic if it means compromising the fundamental truths, uh, the doctrines that are important to us, or the important history and traditions that any particular group has, that this has to be part of the entire blessing for all of the church. Now, we are unfortunately seeing the clock ticking, and we have two more times we want to hear from the bishop, and we definitely want our panel to share on their own insights. The question that I posed to the bishop, the next to last question, actually, was about a very important meeting that he hosted in January of 2010 there in Lebanon. And he was very proud about this meeting and very clear about its impact. Let's let him tell us about the importance of that gathering. As you know, people are very fascinated to visit Lebanon because Lebanon is a country of communities where we have 18 Christian and Muslim communities living in harmony and constituting the fabric of the society in all levels of their political and social lives. To host this commission in Lebanon was a great honor for us and a great responsibility at the same time to expose the participants of this dialogue to the Lebanese Christian Muslim society life. This dialogue in Lebanon was not only an opportunity for theological reflection of continuing our task of reflecting and discussing our agenda items. But it was an opportunity to meet with Christian and Muslim people holding responsible positions, and also to meet with the people in general and to have discussion with them. Mark, you're Lebanese trained and, and did so much uh, living in, in Lebanon. Tell us a little bit about how hearing that being mentioned by the bishop, the importance of that sea. Tell us a little bit about that for those of us that aren't quite understanding the importance of this. Well, as I said uh, I, in, in one of the programs, each, every other year, the, the venue for this meeting of the, the, uh, the, the Joint Commission does, does change. And, and, and it, was, it was in January of 2010 that, that the Holy See of Cilicia hosted uh, this affair. And it's a very important uh, for both the Oriental Orthodox churches and their, their leaders, but also for the Roman Catholic Church. So important that, that uh, a cardinal was, was assigned and, and chaired, uh, co-chaired that particular thing. And it was uh, Cardinal Walter Kaspar, uh, who just retired from, from, from his position in the uh, Pontifical Council for the Promotion of uh, Unity. I'm not saying it right, but... but exactly. It, uh, and, and, and it was, it was uh, a proud moment for me when I was listening, happened to be listening to our Divine Liturgy, our Mass, uh, via Internet, when, when it came time for the homily, who, who stepped up to the mic but, but the cardinal himself? And he, he nice. delivered the homily uh, in, in English, and it was translated uh, by uh, Bishop Nadeg in, in, in Armenian right on the spot. Wow. Uh, and he spoke about the, the, the commitment that, the, that the, the Catholic Church has for, for dialogue, for uh, ecumenism. And, and, and for communication. So uh, Lebanon's a great, it's a great place. It's historical. It's biblical. 
uh, and, and it was a wonderful place to have a meeting and, and, and uh, many, many sites, uh, many historical sites, many, many Catholic uh, 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 sacred shrines in, in Lebanon, uh, including Mount, uh, where, where the, uh, the Holy uh, Virgin is, uh, there's a statue of uh, Hadisa. Uh, who's perched on a very, very tall mountain. There's many monasteries in, in those areas, ancient uh, Catholic Maronite uh, monasteries, so it's, it's a wonderful place. Next to the Holy Land, it would, it would be definitely a place that you would want to, to, to visit uh, to, to get an understanding of our, our, our Christian uh, history. Father Arshin, you also please share. Um, Jim, what actually uh, struck me in what Bishop Nadek said is, is, is this reality also. The Middle East is the birthplace of Christianity. And unfortunately, political circumstances are forcing Christians to leave. Yeah. And the, um, the number of Christians um, in the Middle East in general, uh, in Palestine, in Lebanon, is diminishing uh, every year. And that makes it more urgent for the Christian communities to dialogue, not just with one another, but with the other faiths. Uh, the Middle East is politically fractured. Unfortunately, the political divisions are demarcated by faiths, religious commitments. It is not necessarily a religious conflict. It is a political conflict that is taking a religious face. Yep. And uh, it could lead to greater disaster if the dialogue doesn't continue and people do not learn how to differentiate between a faith commitment and a political ideology. One last question is left for the bishop to help us close our own discussion and to uh, wrap up our program. I asked him, what is that challenge that His Holiness Aram I gave at the famous meeting in January, this very important gathering, January of this year? And here's what the bishop said, Aram I said. The invitation of His Holiness Aram I was to not be satisfied with whatever we have accomplished but to go ahead, to be brave enough to step on new ground of bringing churches together to give a concrete expression of the unity of the church. In that sense, His Holiness also asked us not to deal with pure theological issues but to embark on reflecting and dealing with contemporary social, moral, and ethical issues that are affecting our life and the scientific world also is looking for some answers from the church. You know, I am just remembering with such joy the full hour of the bishop's conversation, of which we gave you about 15 minutes over the two programs. So I hope you enjoyed hearing Bishop Alamizian in those little bites where he answered a specific question. Regarding this last question, I really think he landed on some very strong points about we don't want to settle with what's easy, with what we've done, that would be just not enough. Father Gregory, where do you see the implication of that and what it is that maybe you would see is the next bold step that we might want to be able to take together? Well, what I could hear from Bishop Narag is that there were certainly some who felt um, some hesitancy or fear with the election of a new pope as if to say that the ecumenical movement is just dependent upon one particular leader. I think that um, what's become clear is that um, a leader sets the tone, but this has been the work of the Holy Spirit, and that in every level of the church, 
So I think more and more for all Christians to get to know and to be practicing their own faith with devotion and then with love and charity to reach out toward others um, is participating in something wonderful the Holy Spirit is doing to try to lead us uh, in an everly increasing secular world that sometimes is hostile to the faith to unite together and to recognize the beauty of, of faith in one another. Father Arshin, any concluding thought about the importance of this topic for you and your church or for anything that Bishop has said? Uh, Jim, it is, it is very, very important. Uh, the only thing that I wish is that these discussions that are going on both between um, the Oriental Orthodox churches themselves or any um, inter church and interfaith dialogue on any level, somehow we, we, have found, we have to find the way yeah. of making the average person on yeah. the pews be aware of this. Yeah. There is a great gap between the official discussions and the uh, coming down of those discussions and their impact on the pews. Uh, we have to, uh, to find the way of, of accomplishing that. I think the church will be strengthened, faith witness will be more and, and stronger, and uh, mutual respect will increase if we can accomplish that kind of communication. Mark, 30 seconds, final thought? I, I think I have to echo, echo with what, what Father Arshin mentioned because uh, Bishop Nottig lamented upon the fact that all the, the meetings that take place on the, on the higher levels don't seem to filter down, even, even to the diocesan level. Yes. And, and that's a problem. And, and we, need to, yeah. we need to have it on the local level and the diocesan level, mm -hmm. and, 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 and we need to pray uh, that the Holy Spirit acts and, and pray that at one point we will, we will be surround, surrounding one table and one cup. I hope that you will watch this program again if you joined it late. It's on YouTube.com slash KNXT1. You can find it there. And we hope you'll be back next week for another forum. And until then, God bless.